Hello everyone, welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith and I'm very excited today to be bringing you a brand new Rolling Solo showcase here on the channel. One that I've wanted to do for quite some time and it is the perfect time being that we're coming up to Halloween to dive into the board game Nemesis. This comes from Awakened Realms and I'm really excited to show you guys how this plays in a solo capacity. Inside of Nemesis, you're able to play this either solo or fully cooperative. Now, when I go ahead here with the setup and what we'll be moving into with the playthrough to come is going to be a novel which was unlocked as part of the Kickstarter called The Untold Stories Number One. Now, there's another novel coming in Untold Stories Number Two and so on in the upcoming Wave Two of Nemesis, which I have yet to receive but recently got a tracking number four and others have started receiving theirs as well so that's extremely exciting so what this is going to do is give you a good idea as to how this comic book plays out and that's exactly what's inside of this untold stories is a full-on narrative behind each and every scenario throughout a campaign so hopefully if you're willing to join me how about we find out where our story begins in nemesis Turns out, even with half the human race gone, it's still hard to get a decent job. My father was a saturation diver, one of the worst gigs on old earth, though well paid. He spent weeks in a steel tube with a bunch of sweaty guys. Any malfunction would mean a messy death, and he had goosebumps every time something creaked. For me, it's about the same, only the pay is worse. Twelve years ago. A dark and deadly wanderer came from somewhere outside our galaxy, at half the speed of light. When it glanced Earth, smashing our moon to bits, everything descended into chaos. People thought that was it. We'd never recover, but we did. The stuff we found in the fragments of the wanderer kind of helped. Exotic matter, isotopes never heard of in the solar system multi-dimensional crystals. When we ran out, we wanted more. So asteroid mining took a back seat. Old ships were being repurposed as deep space whalers and sent into the Oort cloud. They spend months looking for objects coming from God knows where. They use hyper jumps to close the gap. At these speeds and g-forces, it only takes one error, one miscalculation. Some crews have disappeared. I keep hearing rumors they found more than they have bargained for. Still, the spice must flow. We all sign NDAs the length of a toilet roll. And cybersecurity squads purge whatever they want from the net. Guess I can only hope that next time it won't be me. Just like my father did. Especially now. Signing up on a ship with a name like that was just looking for trouble. Sedna Outpost, Outer Solar System. We're home. Precisely 300 astronomical units from home, but it's close enough. We're still lightheaded, memories are hazy. A familiar feeling, as if a part of you was left behind with every jump and took several hours to catch up. When our souls return to us, we'll be waiting for them over a round of drinks in some cozy access denied. Airlocks disabled. Boarding bridge detached. What? Platform 6 is closed for maintenance. Please vacate this area. You've been placed under quarantine. Sorry for your inconvenience. Ground control. What the hell is this about? Say again? Get me a flight director or... Please await further instructions and have a nice day. Ground control out. I don't like this one bit. Anyone receiving? Good job, you've kept your personal comms open. Friendly advice from another crew here. Looks like you're screwed. The word in the colonies is your ship was lost with all hands. And there's a welcome party on the way. They're packing gear that can break open your can in seconds. Look, I'd hate to be in your shoes, guys, but if I were, I'd probably do my best to get as far away from this place as possible. Good luck. Disconnected. In this line of work, you're either ready 
for anything or dead. They can control almost all of the ship remotely, but we know a trick or two. We don't know what game they are playing. One thing is for certain, no one will boss us around our own ship. So now we're going to move into mission number one setup. There are 12 steps that you'll find inside the Untold Stories booklet. It'll also give you a depiction of how this thing should be laid out visually, but also a step-by-step. -step. There are 12 steps for setup. I've already gone through six of them. I'm going to talk about them really quick right now. The very first one is to ensure that you're on the alternative side of the game board. That's the side that has two different ventilation systems depicted by red and blue. You can see them right here here blue and red you also notice the light inside of them helps you also realize which ventilation systems connect to that particular color and they're color coordinated so you'll see right here this section or this area whatever location ends up being in here has red attached as well as blue some of them are going to have one or the other, some will have both, but they'll all matter in terms of the noise that happens within the ship, and it's also a part of managing what potentially could be a nasty situation. Now, there's also cards that allow characters to actually use the ventilation ducts as well, but only specific characters. We'll talk more about that and how the ventilation systems work later on, but it's a really integral part to the gameplay and something to be aware of because things can move through vents, as we very well know in the alien world. Now, moving into the next steps for setup would be based on these location tiles throughout Nemesis ship. Some of these are preset and they're already face up. In a normal game in Nemesis, you move in and you don't know what locations are there. In this particular game, you're going to have a number of different locations already face up. So we have the nest right here, along with a couple tokens that are specific to the Untold Stories campaign that you're not going to find anywhere else. And those particular tokens are event tokens, which is denoted by a number underneath two in this case. So that's going to tell us to go into the Untold Stories booklet and reference that number to find out what happens in the story. And this right here is just an on entry token, which essentially means once we move into that location, we then have to go ahead and deal with the event. So they're kind of one and the same connected together. Further up the ship, we also have the command center and the monitoring room. One thing you're going to notice is that these little arrows right here pointing into the location and every single one of these locations has a red arrow. What these depict is is how much items are available to be searched through when you're in that location. So you'll see that the game actually sets it up so the command center has zero and the monitoring room also has zero. The nest always has zero and we have another room way further on the other side of the nemesis ship as well. And that room in the top right hand corner is the laboratory and is also set to zero. You can see that on the arrow and the numerical number underneath. Again, in a normal game of Nemesis, you're going to flip over a tile inside of this room and that's going to depict how many items are potentially searchable. But because these ones are preset face up, at least in this mission, these particular ones don't come with the ability to search for additional items. Next step is to set up the evacuation section tiles A and B. And you can see B is right down here set to zero in terms of number of items that we could potentially get here. And also the rules state that we cannot reach, players cannot reach the evacuation section during this mission. So in other words, when we set this thing up, we're probably gonna be cut off from a certain section of the ship based on this mission only. Normally, it'd be really good to get to an evacuation section as long as your objectives are done and get the heck off the nemesis but in this case we don't have that option however the reason that they're set up there you think why are they even in place is because there's actual events that may trigger something happening with these evacuation sections later on so we won't really know exactly what those are until we actually progress a little further into the gameplay so this is evacuation section b set up and as you can see on the complete opposite side of the nemesis a past the hibernatorium which is this giant blue area right here we have evacuation section a again set to zero for the number of items we can potentially search for it there. 
The next step of setup is to get three damaged tokens and place them in each of the slots of the engine rooms. That's right, the Nemesis is hurting right out of the gates. Now, all this knowledge is known. We know going into this mission that all three engines are down. We need to actually fix them as part of one of our major objectives in order to win this mission. We'll talk about all the objectives we need to complete to win later, but you now know at least one of them. Get these red damaged tokens tokens out of there and remove them and leave only the working tokens left over. We need this Nemesis ship in top shape. Now, saying that, one of the major parts of Nemesis that's really exciting when you're playing this game with other players and you're playing the regular game of Nemesis, not this campaign, those engine tiles are actually flipped over and that information is hidden and shuffled and you don't know what state any engine is in until people start trying to go into those rooms and either tinker with the engine, take a look at it, fix it, and all that kind of stuff. And that's where the betrayal really starts to set in among a bunch of other different things that could be classified as betrayal. Now, when you're playing in a cooperative or solo capacity during the campaign as I am, all the information for the engines, at least in this mission, is known, so these are going to stay face up. Something else worth mentioning is the fact that there are five sealed off corridors leading to the three engine rooms for the Nemesis. And in order to get to those rooms, we're going to have to get through those sealed doors. We'll be able to do that using cards from our characters. Also, though, doors also provide a bit of a barrier between yourself and potential things like intruders or aliens on the ship. It doesn't stop them outright, but it certainly slows them down. So there is a benefit to having them in place in certain situations, but they can also be a negative when trying to move quickly from one area to the other, as it's going to take you some time to get through those doors. Next up, we're going to move into the character draft. And because I'm playing this solo in a cooperative fashion, I'm going to go ahead and decide to use two characters. Now, I could choose to use more, but again, I want to keep the speed and the pace of this playthrough up rather than having many, many characters to manage at the same time. I think two is a nice number. We're going to go ahead with that for this. So what we do when doing a character draft in Nemesis, take the top two cards from the top of the deck, and we get a choice for our first player or first character as to who that character is going to be. So let's go ahead and flip these cards over and find out what we have for options. The very first one is the Scout. The second one is the Mechanic. The first character is going to be the Mechanic. I'm choosing that one over the Scout. So the Pick Scout card is going to be shuffled back into the character draft deck as we go to determine what the second character will be. So I'll be drawing two more cards off the top of the deck now. I wonder who's going to be joining the Mechanic on the Nemesis. We'll have either a Soldier, which is a not a bad option. Guns are good. Or the Captain. Ooh, both of those are really good options. I'm not too sure which one I really want to do. I like both of them for different reasons, but I think, I think I'm going to go ahead and pick the soldier for this one. So we're going to have the soldier and the mechanic be the two characters moving forward. So now that we've chosen our two characters, we're going to go ahead and set up the mechanic. So we'll use this one as an example. I'll be setting up the soldier in the same fashion. So first off, you're going to need the character dashboard for the mechanic. Next, you're going to take a look on the dashboard and see that the miniature is denoted right there. You'll find that miniature. And you're going to want to also put a colored ring base on that miniature that matches the outline of the character dashboard and the cards you need to find for this particular mechanic. The two cards on the left-hand side of the screen are quest items. These are side quests. They're not required to win the game. They're just going to give you potential benefits for your character. So the flashlight one here has two requirements. One is to pay one action cost. That'll come from your action deck, which we'll talk about later on. And then the other thing says, discard the energy charge to activate this item. So the energy charge is an actual card in the game. So you'll need to not only pay a cost of one, but discard another card in order to activate this by flipping it over and then you gain a flashlight benefit. Also down below here we have another side quest that says simply go ahead and pay one action cost but you have to do this in the storage room and if you do you can activate the card flip it over and gain the benefit. Usually these benefits are permanent. 
Then you also have this card right here, which is just considered a starting item card, and it'll be easily denoted by the back of the card itself. Once you have this, you're going to have it face up because you actually have this in hand from the start, and it's almost always a weapon because, you know, in these types of situations, our characters are smart enough to know they're going to need some weapons based on what's going on here. This is an energy weapon. It's a sawed-off shotgun. It has two ammo, so you're going to place two red cubes on this weapon. So basically, whenever you go into an attack, you have a choice to use your fists, which would be very unwise because there's a very good chance you could end up hurting yourself quite badly, but you could also potentially get lucky and do some damage. But more importantly and, and, and more likely, you're going to want to go ahead and shoot a rifle or a shotgun or something that is going to do some serious damage to the intruder or alien. So to do so, you're going to take away one of these red cubes every time you make an attack. So you'll notice that the ammo will eventually deplete. And once it's down to absolutely nothing, then you really do only have your fists to fight with. The one thing you can find inside the game by searching and through other game mechanisms is you can potentially find more ammo to load your gun back up to full. And at that point, if you have enough ammo, you can go back on the attack path. But typically, once you run into ammo, you start deciding to run away more so than run towards the intruders. In the top right hand corner of the sawed off shotgun you'll see two icons. The one at the very top right, that denotes that this weapon can only be used during combat. If you ever see that top right icon with an X through it, the card cannot be used during combat. That's going to be more so for the action cards. You'll see where there's a gun with the X through it. Now the icon below it, which is a hand holding a handle, basically means that the item that you have is considered extremely heavy and each character can only carry two really heavy items. Heavy items, for example, could be, well, a sawed-off shotgun, could also be an egg, or it could be a body. Now let's say hypothetically that you happen to run into an intruder or alien while playing Nemesis, because that won't happen, will it? And you happen to take a light wound. Well, if you take a light wound, you're going to go ahead and start tracking it with this glass bead like so. That's the first light wound you took. Second light wound will bring you down to here, and the third will finally bring you to a serious wound card, where this will just basically be put aside again. Once you get three serious wound cards, the lights go out, your character is done. So you're going to want to try to avoid that at all costs, and there's going to be times where you don't even track light wound to light wound movement on this board, and you'll just take a straight up serious wound card. Yeah, some of the intruders are that vicious. I've also gone ahead and put two more glass beads on the character dashboard as we may need them to denote whether we are slimed or whether we've sent the signal. And the last thing to mention is the action card deck on the far left hand side which is all shuffled up. This is a deck of cards that you'll be drawing from in order to give yourself the chance to use abilities on those cards or use those cards to spend to do basic actions that cost one like movement, shoot, melee attack, picking up heavy objects, trading and crafting items or use it for two or spend two to do careful movement. We'll talk about how all of those work when we actually get into the gameplay. It'll make it a lot easier. All action cards that are discarded will be placed on the right hand side of the character dashboard. And the mechanic is going to be the first player, so the first player token will be placed just underneath the action deck. I've gone ahead and set up the soldier in the exact same manner as I did the mechanic, the only difference being that there is no first player token for the soldier. There's also differences in terms of the starting quests as well as the starting card for the soldier. Everything else is exactly the same. I shuffled the action card deck, but remember there are differences in that action card deck from what we'll see in the mechanics deck as well and some similarities. In terms of the quest items, we have armor and we have auto loader. For armor, we spend one and discard tools or duct tape, we can activate that item and get some armor. For this quest, we it's for an auto loader and we spend one and activate this item in the armory room only. We can activate that, get an auto loader from that armory room, which is pretty thematic and also very cool because this soldier has an awesome weapon already. This is the assault rifle and it's an energy weapon. It's also extremely heavy and obviously is used during combat. It has an ammo of five, which I've already put on the gun and has a really cool ability, very different from the ability actually on the mechanic, which I didn't talk about but that ability will make a lot more sense when we start rolling the combat die so i didn't mention it right now but in terms of this one each time you deal at least one injury deal an additional injury so that one's pretty straightforward basically you're doing even more damage to the enemy 
Something else that you'll need during setup is to ensure that each character has their own pass card, but you'll notice which one's which by flipping them over. There are five of these in the box because you can have up to five players. In this case, we are controlling two, so you are player number one will be for the mechanic and player number two for the soldier. They're also really handy because they actually give a nice overview of the different phases that you're going to have to go through as well as the steps inside of them. So you're going to want to keep this close by. This will also give you guys a nice visual representation as to when I I pass with my character and finish my character's turn. I've gone ahead and shuffled and set up the three item card decks. The first one there, which is green, is considered the medical item cards. The yellow one at the very top is considered the technical item cards. And the one in the middle, which is red, is the military item cards. I've also gone ahead and set up the contamination card deck and the serious wound card deck. It's important to note that a section of the ship is actually shut off to us and we aren't able to access it. And that's going to be this area here with all the twos as well as the bridge itself. The hibernatorium is open. So now that we know where we can't go in the ship, we need to know where we can go, at least the spaces that we haven't populated yet with rooms. So you'll notice here on the game board, we have four spots with number one slots available. And at this step of the setup, we're gonna place four random one tiles into these slots face down. We won't know what they are until we get into them. But before we do that, we're gonna remove a couple from the pool in order to tailor it for this mission. And this is based on the mission set up in the Untold Stories booklet. So we're going to be removing a fire control system. This is a one tile which will not be part of the pool. The other one tile we're removing is the generator tile. And lastly, a tile that's actually a two tile is going to be removed from the game, although I don't believe, unless there's some event that ties into this somehow, this matters at all because we already know we can't access any of the escape pods. We can't go to the evacuation section B. All this is locked off to us on that side of the ship and is inaccessible during this particular mission. But it does state in the rules to remove it, so I'm going to do it anyway, even though it's a two. So what we're left with after removing these tiles is actually four one tiles. So it's simply a matter of randomly shuffling them and placing them on the game board. And just like that, all four of the empty room slots now have a face down room tile. The next step is to prepare a special pool of exploration tokens and you can see how I've got them lined up in rows. So at the very top we have the danger tokens, then we have the door tokens, malfunction tokens, slime tokens, fire tokens, and silence tokens. The reason that I have them set up the way I do in front of the camera right now is to make it easier for you to understand which ones I'm pulling apart and using as part of the special pool. You'll notice from left to right, the numbers inside these cubes numerically get higher as they go left to right. The game rules state that I take one of each kind of token except I need to take three malfunction tokens. But I need to ensure when I'm taking multiple of a certain token that I take the lowest value in the cube area from that pile of tokens. So you'll see here I've got the two, which is lower than the three, a one, which is lower than all of these, a slime three, which is lower than the four, and so on all the way down. But when it comes to the three malfunction, I've got the three lowest numerical values inside this area. And this is done on purpose by design. The numerical values that sit inside of the cubes are going to be what is revealed to us when we actually move into a room, which is then going to set the amount of times we can potentially search in that room. The next step was to shuffle all the special pool of exploration tokens face down so that you don't know which one's which, and then place them randomly on all of the flipped upright tiles that we have access to during this mission and face down ones that we have yet to reveal as well without putting any on the command center and it's one per tile. So you'll see here, we've got one on the nest, we've got a couple here on the one tiles, we've got one over here on the comms room, one on a one tile, nothing on the command center, one in the monitoring room, one on the one tile in the back, and then one on the laboratory in the far back right hand corner. 
It's also important to note that like a few other major rules inside the core game of Nemesis, there are changes for how you use the exploration tokens which we just placed on all of those room tiles when we reveal them. So when we do reveal them, we are going to set the rooms to that number of searchable items potentially to be found there. And in addition, we're going to reference an exploration legend, which is on the Mission 1 setup book, which is going to tell us if we happen to pull a slime or a danger or a fire, which number event we go to, whether it's 1, 3, 4, for example. And that's going to be having us go to reference certain parts of the comic inside of the Untold Stories book, which is going to throw all kinds of fun curveballs at us that we won't know until we reveal that stuff. So without spoiling anything further, I'm just going to let it happen as it happens. And just so you guys can understand what I was talking about in terms of the exploration legend, this is what I have to reference and I have to flip into further pages to find the event based on the exploration token we reveal. So if we have to move into a room and it's slime, I'll be going to find event number one of which I'll read to you and we'll just follow the story forward. As you can see, a number of different things are going to trigger depending on what we run into. This right here is the self-destruct track. And in the setup of this one, we're going to be placing a time marker on the appropriate slot of this self-destruct track based on the number of players. So we're playing with two players. So this is going to sit on the third slot. Again, this self-destruct track is going to be working differently than what would be experienced in the normal core game and where the skull is, which would usually represent the entire ship exploding into a ball of flames, instead is going to have event number six placed on top of it. Now let's move into the mission overview. Some of these points I might have brought up as we went through this setup, but I want to reinforce some of them because they're special to this mission number one. First thing is a part of the ship is inaccessible and we already know that everything over here that's tile two that doesn't have a room in it or the bridge you cannot get to or go to. The second thing is the expiration tokens are used to trigger special story events. We now know this based on the last couple clips. The Marines are about to board the ship, so time is going to be extremely short. So the game is already warning us of that. There are no intruders or noise rolls, so that's another reason you might have noticed that I didn't set up anything to do with the intruders, including the intruder board or the cards that go along with them, because, well, they're just not a part of this and neither is noise. Your items and status are going to carry over to future missions. So that's interesting. So basically anything we gather through this mission, we get to keep going into the next mission, including statuses. And we do not reveal any event cards during the event phase. So that's another deck of cards that I didn't set up during this setup video. So what is the goal of mission number one? What are our tasks? Well, we have to manually engage all three of the engines, meaning we have to set all of them to working. And they're currently, as I mentioned earlier, damaged. We also need to use the comms room or communication room to send a signal by any character. This will remotely hack the Sedna flight control. We're going to want to try to gather any items that might help us survive future missions during this mission. Although we know time is short, we're going to want to try to search and obtain some items to bring with us into the next one. Finally, we'll need to get back to the hibernatorium on time. If all the engines are green and the signal was sent by at least one player, at that point players can vote to take off at any moment. If the vote results in a draw, the player with the first player token has the final say. Now we know I'm playing solo cooperatively, so because of that, whatever I say goes. It's extremely important to mention that all players need to be back at the hibernatorium when the ship takes off. Any characters that are outside of that location are killed on takeoff. Our characters begin in the command center. And that's going to conclude the setup for the untold stories within the game of Nemesis. Thank you guys so much for watching and as always, keep on rolling solo.